Hello, and welcome again to the All Things Renovation Women in Series podcast, where I'm using this platform to talk with amazing women who are doing their thing in the trade sector in hopes that A, people are listening, obviously, and B, that by shining a light on their stories, other women will feel comfortable considering a career in the trades. Well, maybe not just women, but men too. And after all, if you can see it, you can believe it, and then you know you can be it. I'm really excited to have Rachel Schatz on the on the on the call today. Did I say your name right? Schatz, yes. Schatz. Sorry. I'm really excited to have Rachel Schatz on the show <laughs> today. Uh, she is a Red Seal plumber and gas fitter with over 15 years experience in the construction and service industry. After many lonely years as a woman in the construction, she was given the opportunity to train two women almost all the way through their own plumbing apprenticeships. And in 2019, she made the switch to education where she obtained her adult education diploma and is currently the only female teaching in BCIT's piping department. She's a huge believer in representation and being the only female in the piping department is it's critical for women coming through the program to show them that they do belong there and that we really can, all of us collectively, accomplish what we want. And this is a position that she has always dreamed that she would be in and now here she is. So I'm so glad to have you here. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, the invite. Yeah. So let's just start off with how did you get into the trade se sector? Tell, tell me, tell us about your journey to get here and when did you get your certifications? Any like highlights, lowlights? Just, let's just start with the genesis. How did you get into trades? Well, I uh, lived in a small town and uh, didn't really have much going on. I didn't go to university. I didn't really go to college and was working in a restaurant and, you know, I worked hard and I had a regular customer that came in quite often and he was like wow you're such a hard worker you should come work for my company and I was like oh like what do you do and he's like I'm a plumber and I was like oh like doing reception or like in the office and he was like no like as a plumber and I laughed and I was like I'm not gonna be a plumber that's stupid girls don't do that <laughs> and you know there was nothing really going on the restaurant I worked at closed down in the winter so um you know, I kind of decided to take a chance because I didn't really have anything else going on. And it was like, well, if I don't like it, I don't have to continue. And like, who knows where this is going to go? Um, so I started October of 2005. Yeah, I think it was 2005. Um, that was when I started. And, you know, it was definitely different than anything I'd ever done, right? I was all of a sudden in this completely different world. And like, I didn't know anything about plumbing. It's not like I did a pre-apprenticeship, right? So yeah. I was sweeping floors and learning what fittings were. That was the first three months of my life was I carried a broom around and learned what T's were and what's a Y. I don't know, go figure it out. So <laughs> yeah, so it, uh, you know, I didn't know if I was gonna continue with it, but uh, I made the move to Vancouver about six months after starting in the trades and then thought, you know, I went and did my level one um, plumbing apprenticeship training and then took a long time to get a job. But when I finally did, you know, it just kind of started escalating and I started falling in love with the work and yeah, ended up continuing until I did my uh, level four in 2010. Oh, yeah. So when you took this chance to like get into the trade with this invitation from this man who was like the regular at the restaurant that you're working in, like, how did you make that decision? Like, I'm, I'm always interested in like how people like got the courage to like do something completely outside of their comfort zone. So was it a big stretch for you? Or are you someone who's a little bit more of a risk taker and comfortable with things that are a little bit uncomfortable initially? I would say back then I was definitely a risk taker. I don't know about now, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was just kind of, you know, I, my boyfriend at the time, now my husband was like, you know, just go for it. Like you don't have anything to lose. And um, I made some life changes at the time. Like uh, right when I started trades was also when I quit smoking. So that was kind of a weird trade off because yeah. there's so many smokers in the trade. So it was, you know, I got up early and started going for a run at 4 a.m. and just kind of shifted everything in my life at that point. And it just kind of worked and everything just started to fall into place. So, yeah. Excellent. So what were some of the, the highlights or lowlights as you were sort of going through your apprenticeship and working um, 
working in the field in, in the trades back back then um well i mean i don't know how much this has changed but it, it was hard to make friends obviously um i didn't see a woman on the job site for probably <clears throat> excuse me the first five ish years that i was on site um and the woman that I did meet was a laborer who I saw for like five minutes and that was it. So, um, you know, it took a long time to even see women on the job. And then when you did, it was kind of like, they didn't want anything to do with you. Um, and it's hard to make friends with men because there was always, not always, but a lot of the time there was some jealousy issues from their wives because it was like, well, why do you want to hang out with my husband? And I was like, I don't know, cause we just work together all day and I want to go and have a beer, but so it made uh, making friends really hard because mm -hmm. there was nobody to make friends with. So that was kind of a big bummer. Um, so I didn't make work friends, right? It was work and then it was home. And uh, that was something that, you know, continued until recently for me. Like it's always been me and like maybe one other girl. So um, making friends on the job has always been really tough. Um, yeah, that's but, a pretty common common theme where you know like you're the only person on a site or in a business um that identifies as as female and um yeah it's 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 a hard thing when you don't have a peer group that is you know really supportive um and really a, a lot of a lot of people have talked about feeling lonely about being like the sole sort of person who identifies as female representative on a on a site or what have you so totally. any any highlights, any people who were champions or uh, cheerleaders for you along the way that, you know, really made an impact? I've had lots of cheerleaders, cheer, men cheerleaders. <laughs> um, you know, I wouldn't have gotten where I was if it wasn't for the support of a lot of the people um, I've worked for. I've had a lot of good feedback from um, companies I've worked for that I was a really good technician. Um, and I had a lot of good uh, customers in the area that I live. Being a woman in service was uh, very impactful on the women that live in the community. And um, I did find that if I had opportunities. Uh, I got offered jobs quite a bit um, mm -hmm. when I'd go to the suppliers and stuff because word of mouth travels, right? And, you know, so I did get offered jobs quite a bit because I was a woman. And the feedback in the community about me was very, very good. I mean, I'm very clean, I'm tidy, I always try to do a good job. And I also live in a community where there's a lot of widowers. And so, you know, there was a bit of a safety thing there for um, local women with having a woman come and do the work in their house. So um, that was always a positive, positive, pardon me. And, you know, I have met a lot of awesome people uh, and I've never really felt like I was denied opportunity as a woman. In fact, I feel like a lot of the guys were like, you know, pretty happy to have me on board because I think I have a lot to offer and you know it wasn't always the case in the beginning you know some guys thought that you were stupid because you're a girl or you know you didn't have anything to offer but that changed um, as I was more involved in the service industry and kind of got to know my way around stuff and yeah I uh, I, I have a lot of champions <laughs> oh fantastic I love to hear that absolutely um, so you got your ticket you're working you're doing your thing so why the shift into education I mean it's a it's a great path and a, a shift but so but why why the shift to education for you well I always wanted to be a teacher as you kind of said in the beginning um that was kind of where I wanted to go when I was in high school but I didn't really want to go to university and I didn't really want to go to college and was kind of like I don't really know what I want to do so I didn't do anything um you know, I really loved having apprentices in the field and teaching and, you know, my feedback from my apprentices was that I was good at it. And um, one of my apprentices actually did um, the trades discovery program at BCIT where I work. And um, the person that runs that program was actually looking for a plumber to replace her position because she just couldn't keep up with, you know, her own job and so I kind of jumped on that and was like, hey, maybe this would be kind of an in for me to kind of make the switch over to getting involved with teaching. And so it kind of happened. It took a long time for us to be able to connect just due to busy schedules. But um, 
eventually I went in, had an interview and kind of got hired to do nine weeks a year. So that worked out well for me because I could kind of stay in the field and continue doing what I was doing, which I really liked. But then I could also kind of move in that direction towards education also. Um, and I kind of started working on my adult education diploma around this time anyways, to kind of give myself a bit of more credibility for applying for uh, jobs at BCIT. And uh, yeah, so she hired me on for the nine weeks and I was doing my second week. I did my first week shadowing under her, my second week by myself. And I got pulled into the um, department head office in the de uh, piping department and he had my resume on his desk and basically offered me a full-time job. So I took it. Excellent. So, I mean, something that I, I've heard a number of times is something I absolutely believe in is this concept of lifelong learning. And I think that just your story there about getting into the education and getting in, uh, doing some, you know, coursework and all that kind of stuff, you know, it, it afforded you the ability then to jump into this this role and mm -hmm. had you not taken that on to begin with you maybe wouldn't have gotten the job so I yeah. just I love to to point out and highlight for people who happen to be listening no matter what what, what sector you work in there's always yeah. a case for lifelong learning and education is never a waste and you know I just you just never know where it will take you so total props and kudos to you for sort of taking that initiative and and getting into something that you didn't even know would really get you to a certain place but you know you knew that you know if you wanted to get into teaching in any way shape or form you're going to need some kind of education behind you so I think that's fantastic oh thanks yeah it was a it was a good decision for sure and uh you know I wasn't really sure how much value the course was going to have for me but it did really kind of open me up to see things from a different perspective and like you know I don't look at students the same way as I looked at, you know, other tradespeople out in the field, even though they're kind of one in the same, but it, it's changed the way that I perceive people. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, the course was good. I took a lot more away from it than I actually thought I was going to. So there you, are. you just never know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, you, now you work at BCIT, you've gone through the apprenticeship program yourself. Um, What's your take on the apprenticeship program as it sits now? Um, I don't know what you know about the, the historical pathway to it or whatever, but I, my sense is that, um, you know, we need a little bit more um, uh, support from government at all levels, you know, funding and all of that kind of thing. But I still think apprenticeship is a really fantastic way to learn while you earn and, you know, be able to, serve the community at large and and for businesses to have people who are gradually getting better at what they do and, and moving ahead so I mean is that very similar to what your take is on apprenticeship or are you feeling like it, it, there might be a better system or that you you love it you hate it like lay it on me what do you think uh, I I love I love apprenticeship training I think it's phenomenal you get to do the hands-on and actually work with what you're working with you get to use the tools you get to work under several different people with different ideas and then you go and do the theory in school and you know you get to apply some of that when you get back out in the field again and things kind of start rolling to make more sense um i mean i can't speak for all trades and what all trades do but i can speak for mine and like with the harmonization that's happened meaning now everything is kind of canada wide so um, before it was kind of provincial and now they've harmonized it. So the training you get in Ontario is very similar to the training you get in BC. So if you do decide to move provinces, you're still pretty, pretty well versed in, in the same stuff on both sides of the country, which is awesome. Um, and, you know, there's so many different niches in, in my trade anyways, like, you know, it's not just that you build houses or you don't just build towers or you don't just do commercial. Like there's all these little facets of plumbing and you know, it's such a huge field. It's not just like this one thing, like, um, you know, there's water treatment, there's uh, sewage systems, there's private sewage systems and there's pumps and there's hydronic heating and you know, there's drainage, there's water and like, there's so much to know and you know one of the things I always tell the foundation guys when they're going through which is the pre-apprenticeship um 
you know, find your niche. Like, what do you like about plumbing? What is it about it that you enjoy? Because if you can become really good at that one thing, right, then you can make a lot of money and be the guy, like the guy that everybody wants to ask about, you know, oh, blah, blah, he's really good at hydronic heating, we should ask him. And, you know, I don't think a lot of people realize how big this, this particular um, industry is. And, you know, the longer I teach, and the more I'm in the industry, and yeah, I have 20 years experience, but at the end of the day, I would say, I don't know anything right? Because there's just so much to know and the industry changes so fast. And like the nice thing about the apprenticeship, at least on my end, is the students coming in are always telling me about new stuff in, in the field, like new industry stuff, new products, new this, new that, which is awesome because I don't have that connection to that anymore. Um, you know, and the other thing about trades or apprenticeship is, you know, that the stigma that it's only dumb people that do that, that don't, you know, go to university because they can't. Well, I hate to break it to you, but most trades are very math and science heavy, right? So yeah. there's a lot of theory that goes into that. And, you know, to it sucks for the people that are apprentices that, you know, hear that because they work really hard. Like I watched yeah. them work hard. And it's not easy getting through these courses. And, you know, I, I hate that stigma because, you know, it's it's not easy to do and not everybody can use tools and not everybody can do math and like, but they try and they get through and it's a great skill that they end up with. And, you know, even if you're not really good at school, it doesn't mean you're not good on the tools. Even if you can squeak by, you can still be awesome at your job. Oh yeah, right? for sure. But, and the other thing I like to, sort of point out to you know people who are not in the trades or or maybe casting a little shade that way is just how much problem solving we do in the trades like ev everything is a problem that needs to be solved you know even totally. if you're doing something right from scratch it's like you're still basically deciding where something goes or how we're going to get it through here and the plans showed this and this is not what the site has and like what are we going to do to like get from point a to point b and how is that going to work there's there's always a problem to solve and there's a lot just a lot of problem solving that goes in and people can be very creative and really smart around what that looks like mm -hmm. especially how, like how to navigate the code and like where can we kind of like bend it a little bit that's still going to pass versus like a hard fail and like all of these types of things so i really do think that um as time rolls along and we all advocate a little st stronger for trades. Um, I think more and more people are recognizing that, you know, trades is a really viable thing and that really the world doesn't go around without everybody in it. And especially the trades, like, I, yeah. I, I often come up with this thing where it's like, you know, no matter how nicely you ask Alexa or whatever other, you know, device that you have that can, you know, tell you the weather that doesn't matter how nicely you ask, whatever that AI is they're still not going to be able to like reinstall a toilet. Nope. <laughs> pull wire to like, you know, install a new, you know, panel or something or whatever. Like no matter how nicely you ask or how like, nice your computer is, that none of that is going to actually physically do the work. Right. So we still need people to physically do the work. We need them to do the problem solving that needs to be done within that. And you're right. No matter what trade you're in, there are lots of pathways to take. Mm -hmm. And you, well, you just listed a whole ton of them in the plumbing realm. Yeah. And I mean, like, no student loans, right? Mm -hmm. Good money. You walk away with an awesome skill. There's always going to be work. Like, we're going to use toilets. It's not like that's going anywhere, right? So, yeah. and that's just one example, of course. I mean, again, I can't speak for all trades, but we're not going anywhere. And we're just going to need more and more people because as the older generation leaves, right? We need to fill those spots. And trades is booming right now, especially in the lower mainland, right? So, yeah. you know, there's no shortage of work. And, you know, if you're a service person that does plumbing, and you're good at service, like you're going to be making money until you decide to retire. Oh, yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, so how many women are you finding are coming through plumbing piping? You know, I'm not getting a lot in my classes. So I'm doing apprenticeship training mostly now. So I'm not really in the shop that much. Um, we're getting, I'm gonna say maybe two girls every three classes or so um, mm. through. 
it's funny since I started teaching apprenticeship I have had like no women come through we usually get like one every second in class through apprenticeship and I've had like none hmm. so it's almost like they skip my class <laughs> which is too bad but I'm sure that that will change down the line but uh yeah um I definitely see some in the shop sometimes and try to wave but uh you know I don't get out there much so it's I kind of focus on the group that I have and try to get them to where they need to go. And that's yeah. that. Yeah, for sure. So um, I also know that you, um, as part of your trajectory, um, went and took part in a conference out in Newfoundland and you're getting more involved in some of like the bodies that, you know, we mentioned at the top of the show, BCC WID and um, BC Tradeswomen. Tell me a little bit more about that experience, because I know that there are a lot of initiatives that are going on where, you know, you'll be paid um, for your accommodation and all that kind of stuff. And you just go and you show up at these conferences that are really focused on women and trying to move the needle for all of us in the trades and all that kind of stuff. And it, they're very um, well attended and all that kind of thing. So tell me about your experience with attending uh, that the one that you mentioned and maybe others that I'm unaware of. Uh, so it was called the SWIT conference, which was supporting women in trades. Um, there's another one coming up this year, I think in June in Winnipeg, I think is where it is. Um, but yeah, a couple of the ladies from, uh, so there's a, a couple of us female trades instructors and uh, one put out an APB kind of saying who wants to go. And so three of us went um, through BCIT and like, I had no idea that there were so many women in trades. Like, because I just, I never saw anybody, right? So yeah. going to this conference and seeing like all these women from all over the country getting together in Newfoundland, um, and I'd never been to the Maritimes either, so that was awesome. Um, and just like walking in there and being like, oh my God, where did all these women come from? Like, this is crazy. And, you know, some of my experiences with the women on the job before were not very positive. So, um, all of a sudden there were all these smiling faces and like I you know I knew a couple of the women from other trades colleges just like in passing from social media not really like for real and you know then I started meeting people that I knew from online that I follow on Instagram and like all these connections started to be made and it was just like it was mind-blowing I was like oh my god like you guys are real people and like you actually want to talk to me and uh yeah it was just like three days of pure awesome and like meeting the girls from the BCC WIT and you know they had a bunch of their um, girls that had done the regional rep training there and like I was like I'm going home and I'm doing it like I have to do it future regional rep girl and I came home and I signed up and I went and you know that was life-changing that uh, week away it was uh, in the NIMO and there was about uh, 12, 12 of us girls and like, it was a week of getting to know these girls that had the same struggles as me, that had been really lonely and had been through harassment and all this stuff. And it was just like this connection with other female tradespeople that I'd never had before. And like, there was crying and there was laughing and there was drinks and there was, you know, it was just this week of like, really being like, oh my God, I finally feel like I've found my people. Yeah. And it was incredible. It changed everything for me. And from that point on, I started going to meetups and like getting to know more of the girls in the industry through these meetups and like finding support. And like, I didn't have that before. So last year was like a major shift for me with finding all these women and all these people. And they do want to welcome you with open arms. And I'd, I'd never had that before. So it was incredible. And I highly suggest that you know, if you have the opportunity to go to one of these conferences that you, you do, because they're just, they're just awesome. Yeah, I, I was supposed to go to the one in Nanaimo, actually. Um, oh, were you? I, so, something came up and I just, I couldn't, I couldn't go anymore, but I, I was disappointed. And I keep, actually, that's the second or the third time I've tried to go and then something happens and I just can't, can't go. Oh, no. I just, you should Try it's, again. It's, still, it's, still, it's still on my like agenda of to do and what all, all that kind of stuff and I know like Lindsay from BCC WID and all that kind of stuff so it I, it'll happen for me at some point but I know I just keep on like oh I have to cancel oh I gotta cancel yeah. but I I mean what you're talking about here is basically finding community 
Yeah. And I think that's, again, I, I, the same sort of narrative that I'm hearing over and over again. And it's, that was my experience as well when I was on the tools um, that, uh, you know, just this this feeling of being like the lone she wolf or whatever, just not really having the support there or just the camaraderie that maybe you would want to have mm -hmm. just like the inside jokes or the, you know, just like, let's go for drinks app, like all, all of that stuff. It's just, it can be a very lonely existence. And then you're trying to fit in with a bunch of dudes and like, we can all do it. It's fine. But having this wealth and generosity of, of, women that are become like your your support network and your community is is a priceless gift so I'm so glad that you found it oh thanks yeah it was just and it just keeps getting better and like you know we have like our whatsapp chaps uh, or chats pardon me and you know when you're having a bad day you send them a message and be like girls I need to pick me up and you, everybody's got you yeah. and it's yeah it's just incredible it was it was it was amazing and like I I can't even say that enough about how it changed me yeah and I know a lot of them felt the same way so yeah it was uh it's something that you know uh I now see that how much support is required for some of the girls coming into the program or some of the second year apprentices like because you know we're still only like what six percent you know out there which yeah. is not a lot. So you're probably still not really seeing other women on the job and like, they're still feeling that isolation and like, you know, so now kind of one of my goals is to try to reach out to the girls that come through piping and kind of say, Hey, like there's BCC wit and there's this, and they can help you write resumes and, you know, there's support there. And, you know, it's, it's something that I'm, um, I'm working on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So um, with all of that, and, you know, you're jumping on the the exciting train of advocacy and all of that kind of stuff. You um, recently became a board member with BC Trades Women, right? Yeah, I did. It's uh, my first time running for any sort of position like this or a board position or anything. And uh, yeah, I just kind of took a chance and was like, you know, why not me? Why not? You know, I have some experience. I'm an instructor. I feel like I'm in a good place right now to maybe jump on something like that where I can work with other women and kind of see what's going on around the province how can we make things better what can I do to help the people that I'm dealing with at my school and yeah so I uh, kind of threw my name in the hat and ended up getting voted in which was incredible so yeah that was really exciting I don't really know what's coming yet we've only had one meeting so far but uh, yeah it's, Excellent. it's exciting yeah. congratulations I'm so glad to oh, hear thanks. that you've um jumped on the board and to and and again like this is a, another piece of that education of lifelong learning piece in that you know until you're on a board you don't know what you're doing <laughs> yeah. I, I've been on a couple of different boards over time and and I still don't know what I'm doing to be. <laughs> <laughs> well I, I've got an awesome group of girls on the yeah, board with me so I'm not, not really me. like big on the governance and like all of those those bits and pieces like I just that's just not something that's really come a lot through my path but um, yeah, no, I, I enjoy being part of a board, especially one that's effective, uh, not so much with the ones that are not effective. Um, but you know, it's all good experience and to be able to support the community or whatever, your, whatever body that you're on the board for, um, it's, it's all about, you know, contribution at that point and, you know, all of that will come back to, to support you at some point in the future in your life, whether it's just a phone call of support from somebody or, um, or if you're helping to, you know, get someone to the, where they need to go. Yeah. Um, exactly. you know, that's a really important thing too, right? Because a rising tide floats all the boats. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to throw it back to you. Is there anything that you wanted to share uh, with anyone, uh, like any sage advice for people considering the trades or maybe something that you wanted me to ask you that I haven't asked you yet? Uh, I actually didn't really think about that, but um, <laughs> um not anything that I can think of off the top of my head, but I mean, for anybody that is listening and, you know, you're considering a trade, but you're afraid or you think that you don't have support or, you know, you don't really know what to do, just get out there and try. And, you know, maybe the first trade that you try isn't, isn't the right one. It doesn't mean that trades aren't for you. Yeah. Right. Yep. It doesn't mean that it's not 
supposed to be something else, just maybe that particular trade isn't the right fit. And it's okay to try something else. And, you know, I, I believe that there is a trade out there for everybody if they are interested in working with their hands and just kind of utilizing something else. And I mean, there's no age limit, right? I have foundations, people that are 40 years old starting over again and saying, you know what, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to go do this now. And you know what? Take the chance. Do it. You got nothing to lose, right? Yeah. And sure. uh, I yeah. guess that's it for advice. Take the chance. Yeah. You won't well, I mean, it. <laughs> there's also, you know, trade exploratory programs out there. So if you don't know what one you're interested in, maybe you're interested in a couple of different ones, like you can try that exploratory program and get an idea, a little bit more of an idea of what the tools are and how you use them and, you know, be able to ask some questions around like what is the climate around the working environment and all that kind of thing and maybe that would help to define and you know sort of funnel you into you know a or b uh, option and then just kind of go from there well and a lot of the um trades universities like tru bcit camosun around bc like the they're offering those programs now yeah. so some of them are co-ed classes some of them are women specific so, and there is funding and grants associated with those things. So, you know, it, I don't know exactly how long all the programs are, but they're usually about 16 weeks and you get to try 12 to 15 different trades for a week at a time and kind of see what you like, what do you enjoy? And, you know, a lot of the girls that come through that I've met, you know, I haven't really been able to recruit too many plumbers, but <laughs> we're still getting the girls out there, right? And you know, all of them are kind of like, you know, on the fence about it. And then they kind of choose one and go for it. And they're like, wow, this is amazing. Like, I love my job. And, you know, that's what it's all about. And, you know, so if you're not sure, and you do want to do that, like, there are schools all over offering that. And it's a great way to kind of get your feet wet, to get a little comfortable using tools, and then kind of see, like, what do I like? Do I like working with sheet metal? Do I like math? Do I like, you know, whatever uh there's tons of opportunity right and there's uh, trades that you know you wouldn't even think about like millwright or uh aerospace like working on planes and stuff like these are these are opportunities that are there yeah yeah 100 percent um I, I mean you kind of fell into the plumbing realm just because someone invited you in have you ever thought of a different trade that you'd want to try or are you just like really ecstatically happy with being a plumber? <laughs> I do like it. I like piping. I I know that I don't like welding, <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, if I had the opportunity again, I'd probably go with power engineering. Hmm. Yeah, uh, like running big machines and uh, you know doing maintenance on equipment. When I was doing plumbing out in the field, I really enjoyed like uh, equipment maintenance. That was something I really really liked, and I feel like that would have been a good fit for me, but you know, I'm not going to change it now. <laughs> no, probably not. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of people out there that are dual ticketed. I mean, often oh, for sure. like a, you know, carpentry joinery or like a mill rate and boilermaker or whatever, like oftentimes sort of things kind of are like enough that, you know, it's not a huge jump going from something like plumbing to, you know, car mechanics. Gas fitting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I, I mean, I, by trade, I'm a joiner, cabinet maker, um, and I never really. I think if I was to go back, I would probably have tried to coach myself to look more at the wages because mm. cabinet makers, even though they have like a ridiculous amount of fine hand skill and you have like all kinds of tools and whatever, and it just it just doesn't pay as much as like oh. electrician or a plumber. Um, but then would you have been able to use your hands in the way that you wanted to, right? Because with plumbing and stuff, I don't know about electrical, but you're not really dealing with like the little fine details. You know, as much. I think that the thing that I, that drew me to joinery in particular was because it's in a, in a shop, it's a controlled environment. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to the same place every day, you know, doing your thing. And I mean, I did install, I did a, a variety of things within my hands on the tools type of career and you know so I wasn't in the shop necessarily every day because I did some install here and there but um 
you know, I wasn't driving to like two or three different job sites a week and, you know, all that kind of thing. And, and at the time I didn't really feel like that was something I wanted to do. Whereas now I, I don't think I would want to limit myself as much as maybe I did in the past. And with what my life turned into and everything, I think I'd probably go into carpentry. Okay. Um, which isn't that much of a jump, but um, there's a lot within the carpentry side of things with how I need to run my business that, you know, I, I know enough, but I have to, you know, sometimes like go through my code book and <laughs> try and figure some stuff out. But, uh, yeah. you know, if you do it all the time, you just kind of know it. So I think the carpentry aspect would be something that I would consider, uh, I would have considered doing maybe had it. I, had it I definitely see a lot of girls uh, in the hallways in carpentry. Yeah, it's, no, there's... it's very popular. Yeah. And again, there, I mean, you can do like straight up framing all the way through to finish carpentry, which is where a lot of women end up um, because it is fine detail and we do have an eye for it and we are organized and you know, tidy and you all like just stereotypically, there are a bunch of sort of boxes that get ticked off for, for women. Right. There, but, um, but yes, that would probably be mine. Um, so before I go to close out the show, um, I always like to ask this like little fun question. Um, so what's your favorite tool and why? Oh, my favorite tool. Mm, I think my Sawzall. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it's powerful. And, you know, once upon a time, I was really afraid of it. Like when I first started using it was really scary. And uh, I don't know, over time, you gain really good control with it. And you kind of find that sweet spot, if you will, of using that tool. And, you know, it becomes something that saves you a lot of time if you know how to use it effectively um yeah i remember when we got our first sawzall and it was like wow wow you know like <laughs> wow this thing is awesome yeah so i i dig it that's good all right uh, so what's your favorite tool oh um you know i we call it a blue bar i think it's called a called cat's paw it's basically this little pry bar that has like a, a wedge at the end and then like a nail puller on the other side. They come in a variety of sizes, but the one we I prefer is like about that big. And it just, you, we just, I just use it all the time. You know, you just need a little <laughs> bit of something to align or you, you know, you're just sticking it into something and just, it just, I don't know. It's just such a handy little thing. You know, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's great. I love it. Um, all right, right, Rachel. Well, you know, Thanks again for chatting with me today. And I'm really excited to see what comes next for you and wish you mad success uh, oh, on any of your future educational endeavors. I believe that you're going to try and get a master's, right? I am. I'm thinking uh, maybe end of next year, so 2024. Uh, so I'll probably apply maybe towards the end of this year and uh, hopefully get in at SFU and work on nice. that. So. And, you know, I also wish you the best with you know, helping to move this conversation forward with women in trades and, and your board position and the position you hold at BCIT, you know, teaching and, you know, shepherding people through the apprenticeship program. Hopefully there'll be more and more women in that. Um, and for those who are listening, thanks. I appreciate it. And <laughs> sure to check out our other episodes in this and other All Things Renovation series. And until next time, keep swinging those hammers and keep being badass at whatever career you're in.